I'm Scott L. Miller. It is the 19th of January, 2024. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. I have had a very busy couple of days. My whole week has been uh, really extreme. Just uh, we've had a lot going on. So I'm trying an episode completely shot in the office today to try out some different things. I have my lighting differently uh, set up than I've done before. And we're on the Fuji. Uh, with the 33 millimeter uh, Suri lens and trying that out to see how this looks. I don't have curtains yet behind me that is coming in a future update and I hate that there has to be some wires behind me back there but overall I think that the look of this is pretty good so I'm excited to give it a try and see what we can do as we try to just shake things up and bring a couple different looks to the show and do a couple different formats. Today, we're doing a Q&A based on a number of uh, things that people have written in over time. Uh, and uh, I didn't have a strong topic today. So before we get to the bump, I do want to say, I really depend on you guys to provide me with topics to talk about. The majority of the things that we cover comes from either questions you ask or, or conversations that I have with uh, my audience. And uh, if you could take a moment, anything that you're, you're feeling you need more information on or things I haven't covered or whatever, if you could go down there in those comments and ask those questions, sometimes it's a real quick thing and I just answer it there. But sometimes like yesterday where we talked about public things um, that was uh, a number of people had commented on one of the shows uh, that that was something we had overlooked until so we got an entire show out of that. So I depend on these things, have a question, and it doesn't have to be in Nicaragua, Latin America, moving, relocating taxes, uh, whatever. Scroll down there, ask that question. That'll help us uh, make topics for the future. And yes, those things really do turn into episodes because we put out an episode more than once a day. So having quite a few of those those items is really important. And if you have that question, chances are someone else does too. So ask that, we're gonna get to the bottom. Welcome to today's show. I'm glad you're here. We're doing a little bit different format and I'm going to start actually not with a question. I'm going to start with, uh, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce this. So Luna Alchemy 4623 um, really left a comment, not a question, with some information. So he says, or she says, I don't know, uh, just throwing my two cents in about this topic. This was about short term, short -to term rentals in Nicaragua. We have been in Nicaragua for almost two months. What I have found is this. On Airbnb, you can often find people who will offer discounts for two weeks plus rentals, most especially if you rent for at least a month. If you rent for longer than a month, you get into multiple months and it's not a super busy Airbnb, you're likely to get a pretty massive discount off the nightly rates. And I can just tell you, just jump in. I've done this personally, not in Nicaragua. I've done this when living abroad. And we've actually used Airbnb to move to countries. And when you go in for months at a time, the discounts are generally extreme. And if they're not, move on to another Airbnb. But they're absolutely correct. This is a great way to get maybe not the lowest price, but it's not going to be the price you see online 99% of the time. The moment you tell someone they're going to have 100% occupancy guaranteed for three months, you're going to get a discount. Trust me. If it's a really booked out Airbnb, then it's unlikely that they would do that because they will lose a bunch of income. But some people really prefer the simplicity of renting to just one person or family and not dealing with multiple rentals. The unpredictability that comes with that and constantly cleaning the place up after people. Absolutely. VRBO, Verbo, as they say, no, is generally more expensive. I don't know why. Maybe the, that's what they say. Uh, maybe this website caters to higher end places but they also seem to have more extra fees and pretty much always add on fees for extra people over two people, which is absolutely not ideal for families. It gets very costly. I don't like dealing with Verbo at all. I'm going to jump in with my own aside here. Verbo, we have used in the past. We have had good luck with them, but it's important to note they're owned by Expedia and we've had some legal issues with Expedia to the point where I would never ever recommend that someone do business with any company associated with their, with, uh, with with Verbo or with Expedia. Um, if you see them on something, run away. Don't, go, don't look at their website. Don't use their resources. Um, we know that here in Nicaragua, um, they are used as a platform for running scams. A lot of times the places that you stay, they're not actually uh, uh, vendors that are on uh, Expedia and their platforms and Expedia doesn't really verify things. Anyone could go on, claim to be any hotel, make an account, collect some money, and run away with that money. And then the people show up to a hotel believing they've paid for the hotel, only to find out the hotel's never heard of them and is not on Expedia. So there isn't that verification. So by using Expedia, 
you are taking a huge risk with your money. To the best of my knowledge, if you pursue things, you'll get your money back. Um, but Expedia does not follow up behind the scenes or has not historically to verify that the people collecting money are the actual properties uh, or, or anything of the sort. And so, and I realize there are some challenges to that, but we've never heard of that problem with uh, booking. We've never heard of that problem with Airbnb. We've never heard of that problem with uh, Hostel World, which is a lot of what a lot of people are moving to because there's lower fees. Um, and so, just watch out if you if you are looking for good prices on things and you see Expedia, be highly cautious. Make sure you have actually spoken to the real hotel that you look them up on a on a third party website. You find their actual website. Uh, you actually talk to them and have confidence that they have received your money. Because if you don't know that, you have no guarantee. And this is, I don't know personally anyone who's ever used Expedia and had good luck with it. That doesn't mean that millions of people don't. It's just, uh, as someone who travels extensively, I've never run into people using Expedia. But as a hotelier, lots of the hotels I know are all aware of this scam that they've all been scammed in exactly the same way. And, and one of the things that's really tough is it's not just that the customers get scammed, right? So you as a potential hotel stayer go and lose $500 because you paid for a hotel and someone took off with your money and it wasn't the hotel and you don't know who got the money because Expedia just gives it to somebody without checking who it is. But also the hotel then feels on the hook because um, a lot of times those customers blame the hotel when the hotel had nothing to do with it. And so the hotels uh, are getting scammed. Often they end up giving away free things um, and being robbed by the, the people who threaten to give them bad reviews for not giving them free rooms because someone else ran a scam. So um, Expedia is uh, very much loathed in the industry and uh, it's, it's not good for anyone. It's not good for the customers. It's not good for the hotels run away from Verbo Absolutely, because Expedia does not stand behind their stuff, it means Verbo, I would never trust them now. I've had good experiences with them in the past, long ago. I would absolutely never consider them now. Back to the, back to the post. We were on Ometepe Island and pretty much focused on settling here for a while. There are actually quite a lot of furnished short-term rentals here. We're looking right now for housing. We have multiple possible options and have seen many other places that we just cho choose we don't want, that we just chose we don't want to live in there are enough places available that we can actually make choices about where we want to live. Everything we have seen so far is decent price, furnished, and available for monthly rentals up to multiple months. Most houses are Nicaraguan style housing. Uh, don't expect overly fancy westernized housing, uh, though that also exists here for rentals of one to many months. People sometimes want you to commit to at least three to six months, but definitely do not always ask for enough to get by. And you can just, per I'm sorry, uh, do not always ask for that. We have seen decent places for anywhere from $300 to $650 USD per month, fully furnished, not massively so, just generally kind of bare bones, but good enough to get by, and you can just purchase whatever else you need, generally including all or most utilities. The places are generally not listed online, but some are, mostly on the local Facebook community forums. And by just posting in the Ometepe Facebook groups, you, we have had multiple people reach out to us offering housing. And by just in integrating into the community a bit, we have even more options constantly being presented. So I just wanted to share that in this area, shorter term, one to multiple months, but shorter than a year, furnished spaces are definitely available in multiple numbers. Uh, they then followed up with an additional note. One more thought. In San Juan del Sur area, there's definitely tons available for short-term furnished rentals. However, if you find it online, the prices are absolutely outrageous, literally three to eight times of the prices I've seen anywhere else in Nicaragua. If you go there in person, you may be likely to find short-term, one month plus, furnished places for much more reasonable prices. We rented a place 12 kilometers outside of San Juan, found it through Airbnb, and could easily turn it into a long-term scenario. It was beautiful on a large farm with our own private pool, so quiet and tranquil, well furnished, stocked, and would have been uh, affordable. I also want to point out back to me that when we were first moving uh, to the area, we were looking at moving a manager to San Juan del Sur. And when at that time, prices are probably just slightly higher now, but barely, right? There's no reason for the market to have shifted. Um, in town, two bedroom, one bath, walkable to the beach was $260 per month furnished if you're on the ground and new people and sent Nicaraguans out to get the pricing. Of course, if you went to the same place, you would expect between 800 and 1200 if you're going through a real estate agency. But if you went directly, it was just 260 per month. Uh, so relatively affordable, even in San Juan del Sur, if you know what you're doing. All right, I got a question instead of just a comment. Scott, I've been getting this advice a lot. 
Before residency, which is required to register a vehicle in your name, simply buy a vehicle and put it under a local friend's name. This appears to be common practice around the beaches of San Juan del Sur and on Ometepe where expats are buying motos, ATVs, scooters, and so forth. What do you think of this? The alternative, assuming a small vehicle is desired, appears to be some sort of long-term rental. Of course, public transportation is still the most reasonable option in most cases. So this is Al Daust. Correct me how I'm pronouncing that. If you guys ever want your stuff pronounced absolutely correctly, feel free to do video. Actually, this would be fantastic. So before I answer Al's question, I would love, this could be AI doused as well. Like it's hard to tell if that's an L or not. Anyway, we're gonna assume it's Al. Um, if, if you would like, and I would love this, if you guys actually did videos of you, like talking head or whatever, to send in your questions, that would be amazing. I'd love to be able to clip those in um, and add them to the show. That would that would add so much dynamic stuff to the show. Like, how cool would that be? And then people could see the audience. I would love that. Um, if you're going to do that, uh, best thing to do, do it in 4K, crank up the quality. Um, I do have, you know, we, we do really high quality videos here, not in, uh, you know, expert editing or anything, just we, we have good cameras and make it look really good from uh, from that perspective. So uh, 30 frames per second, that's important, right? So so do the best quality you can, keep it at 30 frames per second, and uh, we can clip it in. That would be amazing. Um, if you can, put the camera on a tripod or something or get out in nice light, make it look good because uh, you'll be on the show. But how cool would that be? I'd love to have you guys pop up on the show, especially asking questions and stuff. That would be amazing. All right, so let's talk about this. So yes, this is absolutely a common thing. We see this regularly um, and it is worth talking about because certainly you can do this, right? The availability of um, asking a friend to hold a car in their ownership uh, on your behalf is, is very easy, right? You, you come here, you live here, you make friends and uh, you simply go to that friend and say, look, I want to buy a car. Would you put it in your name? So this needs to be someone that you're, you're definitely friends with because there's, there's a couple risks here. On their side, their risk is that you do something illegal with the car or you get in trouble in some way and maybe you skip the country or whatever and it blows back on them. As the owner of the car, they may be on the hook for something. So this is asking a bit of a, a Nicaraguan to do this. Um, if you're going to pay them or something, then, you know, that would be, that would be, fine um but definitely don't pressure anyone to do it make sure it's something that they're very happy to do um and and they need to be aware that there are risks i don't know very many nicaraguans who've gotten into trouble because of this but um it's it's definitely not zero right it is i do know people who have done this and i do know people who have had legal blowback because the foreigner decided to commit crimes and skip the country so um now that was not a close friend it was someone who was pretending to be a friend um, they were definitely just looking for people to use but it can happen and so uh, from a nicaraguan perspective they generally know to be wary of this um, now, if, if you've been here for years, they're a good friend, they're, they're not going to be too worried, but they do have risks, and, and you need to be aware of that, that you're asking, not just for them to put their name on a piece of paper, but for them to, to potentially take on some risk. Now, what are your risks? Your risks should be pretty obvious. You're going to put up a bunch of money to buy someone else a vehicle. You have really no power to claim it is your vehicle, right? You could get a contract that gives you a lot of protections in theory, but at the end of the day, I would be very wary of going to court and saying they stole my car. They're going to say, what do you mean your car? It's legally registered to them. You, you may have a contract with them. That is a civil matter between you guys. Maybe that will be upheld in some way. But at the end of the day, that civil paperwork is basically claiming that you falsified the registration to the government. That doesn't feel like something I would want to go to court over. There's just risks involved, right? I don't know that it would always go badly. I don't know that you would always lose that case, but you would definitely carry risk. You would have risk that your, your legal paperwork doesn't hold up. Um, it may not have been written correctly. You would definitely have risk that the court uh, either didn't honor it because it was defying the official paperwork or that they accepted it, but then you got in trouble for falsifying the official paperwork. Um, there's a lot of potential things to go wrong there. And of course, regardless of any of that, there's an opportunity for someone to simply take the vehicle and sell it. And what are you going to do about it? Right. And they can claim that it was stolen. And what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm sorry, I don't have the car. It was stolen. I wasn't minded. And they were able to go sell it, right, get the money and, and how you'll ever know. 
Um, so I'm not saying that your friends would do that. I'm saying that you're taking on the risk. But imagine if you were in America and you did this and, and you did it with the or Canada or wherever and you did it with the equivalent amount of money more. You went to uh, some friend you had who presumably is not super wealthy and you said in the equivalent amount of money, right? So, so let's say here you're going to do it with a Toyota Corolla. Let's just say it's $20,000. So 10 times or we'll say $25,000. That's probably high for a vehicle you get, but, but bear with me. $25,000. We have another episode where we covered this. And, and they're going to, uh, and they earn $2,500 a year, which is about national average. So when you then say, okay, we're going to get a car that's 10 times your annual income. Now go to the United States and go to someone who's making uh, kind of minimum wage. Maybe they're making $25,000 a year. And you came to them and say, okay, I want to buy this car. It's a quarter million dollars a year. And I'm not legally allowed to own this car. So would you mind if I put it in your name and, you know, if I have a car accident and skip town, well, that's all, you're going to be on the hook. But don't worry, I won't do that. Um, but here's 10 years of your income that I'm going to put into your name, uh, presumably without the obvious tax penalties that would happen in the U.S. The tax on that would be absurd uh, and wouldn't work. But if you were to do that in the United States and you give someone, this is a decade of your income. If you were to take off with this car that legally you own and sell it, you wouldn't have to work for a decade or your family would be set up. You'd have retirement. You could retire right now from the proceeds and live enough, right? You would you'd not be rich, but you would have enough to retire right now. All you have to do is sell this car that technically you own and that I was technically breaking the law to try to hide. Um, while the average person is not going to take that car and sell it, you can easily see that a relatively large percentage of people would, right? And so at what point is it a risk you're willing to take? To that 5% of people would do it, 10%, 30%, suddenly one out of three times someone selling your car. I don't know what the rates actually would be. I don't know what the risk really is. I don't know how much the legal protection could be there, but both sides take on risk and it's, it's a bit of trust and it often leads to animosity. So from a friendship perspective, I would generally steer clear of this as much as possible. From a financial perspective, I would say it's it's relatively foolish. Now, if you have someone that you're really close to, you've known them for a really long time, it's a smaller purchase, right? You're talking about like a scooter, that's several hundred dollars. Like, you know, draw your own conclusions. Maybe, oh, I just don't care. I'm willing to take on a little bit of risk. And, uh, you know, if they take off with it, so be it, right? Okay, right. Just but evaluate those things. At some point, you're you're shifting around a lot of risk and a lot of money, and that may not make sense um, for what you're going to get out of it. I got asked if these glass slats keep out the rain and the heat. If they do a good job of insulating, because of course many of our rooms have air conditioning. So the quick answer on the rain, absolutely. I've never seen rain come in one of these at all. Like it doesn't happen. Um, the way that they're designed, there's no possible way for rain to come in. Now, how well do they insulate? Not well at all. They're absolutely garbage. Uh, there's little spaces between each one and in the corners, like you can see behind me, there's a lot of leakage there as well. There's no way to seal these. Uh, they definitely keep out like wind and storms, but they're not going to keep your insulation good at all. They do an absolute terrible job of that. If you're going to be building your own home and you plan to air condition, yeah, you're not going to want to use these as cool as they may be. I also don't like the fact that they're frosted and you can't see out. I would much rather have a view most of the time. Sometimes I appreciate that it's a little bit frosted and I can have light and I don't have to worry about people seeing in or I'm not getting distracted by what's going on out there. But for the most part, I'd prefer to just have a window. This is my own parking spots right there, right? It's not the outside world. But these are popular for a lot of reasons, specifically because when you open them, the entire window opens up and wind comes through. So if you're not air conditioning, these are exactly what you want. They're strong, they're cheap, they're everywhere. Everyone knows how to use them. And they're perfect for people who are going to be using open air cooling but if you're converting to air conditioning it doesn't work so if you're building your own house and you want to have air conditioning that's your plan don't go with these go with more expensive european style windows that have all the specialty seals and all that stuff but if you're going to be doing open air cooling or it's a part of your house that's open air cooling consider these because they work incredibly well all right good throwback to glass slats those are those right behind me all right adam richie the second or two i don't know uh asked this this is quite some time ago Question, 
What would you suggest for a remote worker? I have a U.S. carrier number for now that works in Central America, but when clients call, they hear a different ringtone than Americans normally hear for domestic calls. It's off-putting for them, and they feel uncomfortable doing business with someone overseas, even though everyone else works remotely from their homes in different states in the U.S. Is there a good international call forwarding service, or could a Google Voice help with this? I also need a U.S.-based number that won't charge roaming international fees. Thank you. Okay, so we have covered this previously, but like it's hard to find it in all the stuff and it's easy to to miss when the information applies specifically to a question so yes this is actually incredibly simple to handle but there's a couple secrets and i think people who don't work in technology often are unaware of the just how this works right the average person especially one that doesn't work online typically works from a cell phone this is their whole world they, they deal with cell phones for all of their calling and a cell phone is unique in how it works and it causes major problems when you're overseas the way that a cell phone works is that you get a carrier service or multiple carrier services I have one from the US T-Mobile that works all over the world so it gives me a lot of flexibility when I'm traveling and I also have a Tigo plan here in Nicaragua that's what I use most of the time it gives me high speed internet and really good service but if something's wrong with it i can switch over to the t-mobile and use that here or anywhere i travel essentially anywhere so i keep the two plus then i still have my us number but if you try to call my t-mobile number here when i'm here in nicaragua i'm going to incur really high roaming fees because i'm not in the us and i'm using a us based service for a cell phone cells are location based so cell phones don't work when you're talking about how do you make calls. That, that's not how you make calls. That's how you maybe make a one-time emergency call. It's good to have a cell phone, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have one, but you do not use cell phones for normal calling. You need to rethink the concept of phone calls. So that's why he's getting, in this case, uh, a different ringtone, because they're calling a US number. And that US number is saying, this person isn't in the US, we're going to forward outside of our carrier to a different carrier, hence a different ringtone. And then we're gonna make it ring in whatever country he's in. So he's going into a roaming thing and changing carriers. That's where things fall apart. You don't wanna change carriers. You want to be on your carrier. So you have a couple options. One, if you turn off your cell service on your cell phone and simply put it into Wi-Fi mode, it's gonna stop being a cell phone and it's gonna turn into a Wi-Fi, or a, I'm sorry, a VoIP phone using the Wi-Fi. And they will not have a way to know that you are not in the US. Literally, your carrier won't know where you are. They might make a guess, but they can't prove it. So they have to treat you like you're in the US, and there is no carrier to hand you off to. So let's just use T-Mobile as an example, but this is true for all carriers. You have your American carrier, T-Mobile. They receive a call, and you're on a cell service, and you're located in, we'll pick Guatemala. For them to get that call to Guatemala, they have to transfer that call to a Guatemalan carrier like Claro. So Claro gets that call and gives it to you. They then make a Claro ringtone. They, they charge you because you're not a Claro customer, whatever. All this complicated stuff happens because you're doing multiple carriers. You're handing off because you're trying to act like a local phone attached to a foreign service that you don't have an account on or you're gonna to have to get a Guatemalan phone number, and then you're on that service, but you're no longer a US number. It's all very straightforward if you think about how it works. There's no magic to it, there's no like surprises, there's no like weird stuff. But if you switch it to only being Wi-Fi calling, forcing your phone to be a VoIP phone, the internet doesn't have locations. Your IP address does not tell anyone where you are. It may suggest where you are, but that is the most of it. There is no carrier type service where you're like, ah, I know their carrier, so therefore I know where they are. It doesn't work that way. There's moments where you can guess at that, but it's always guessing, never proven. Okay, so that's different. With a carrier, you're actually registering with the carrier saying, this is officially where I'm located, and they can locate you to within a meter or so. But with an IP service, they don't even know where you are in the world. They have no way to know at all. So when you switch to that, the only thing that can happen is that your phone reaches out directly over the internet to your carrier's VOIP service. So if you're on T-Mobile, it's gonna connect directly to T-Mobile over the internet and say, I'm here, stop using the cell service, use this instead. This has a number of positive effects. One, you generally are gonna get better quality service because you don't have to go through a bunch of hops of carriers who don't directly talk to each other, don't have the best service between each other. You have no need for multiple carriers, you're going directly to your own. Uh, you can generally go over high bandwidth services. You can control the quality of it because you can put your Wi-Fi wherever you are and control how many things are connecting to it in most cases. But most importantly, 
you are connected directly to your carrier. You're no longer roaming. You are no longer outside the U.S. Your phone is in the U.S. in every sense of the word, except for physically not being there. So by doing that, you can keep using your cell phone. However, there is really no case in any business scenario where you should be using a cell phone to make calls through a cell number. You should not be giving out your personal number for calls. So this is weird remote workers. And I think we answered this at some point. I know we've talked about this, maybe this exact question, but I, I'm not sure. Remote workers should never be giving out their own number. You should be giving out the number of the place where you work and they should be giving you an extension on their phone system like any normal business. The fact that you're a remote worker should never come up, at least not in this sense, not in the phone sense. As someone who works at a phone company, these aren't real things, right? When we have customers and uh, you know, if you are a customer of our phone service and someone said, oh, one of our workers is in Mexico, we'd say, I don't care where they are. What does that have to do with anything, right? We have no care where they are because they simply get a phone, whether it's a physical phone like uh, this one behind me, I don't wanna pick it up, I'm gonna drop it on the floor or whatever, um, or it's a soft phone, just software on your laptop or it's software that you put on your cell phone, not a cell call using this as a computer with an application on it, and it simply connects as an extension to the company's phone system. We don't care if they're in Mexico, in Argentina, in South Africa, in China. Does not matter. It's going to work anywhere that the country doesn't block the calls. So that's how real businesses handle it. And I would make the argument, if your business doesn't do that, calling it a business is kind of misleading. They certainly aren't thinking of themselves as a business. That is the only way the businesses do calls. It is very cost effective, it is very powerful, and they're not handing off the requirements of the business to its workers. At the point that you're providing your own self service, you're not a remote worker, you're a remote business. You're the business and you're making the mistake of using a cell phone instead of a business phone system. So it's just always not the way to do it. A business phone system solves all of this. And a business phone system exists for single person companies, which of course is gonna cost more per person. It's not outrageous. It's like $30 a month to have professional, full-blown enterprise phone systems for a single user. Um, and trust me, that's a real number. And if anyone tries to dispute that, I can prove definitively that, that you can have that for that. Um, that is not a, oh, you can't really get that price. Absolutely, you can. So, so that's all it takes to have, a, if, you're, if you're a remote US worker or a remote Canadian worker and you need to work in Nicaragua, the absolute maximum you should consider paying is $30 a month-ish for, uh, for a, a, an actual phone system in the US or Canada that will actually make US calls and that your calls, whether it's a desk phone or an app on your computer or an app on your cell phone, connects to that, it is literally making the calls from inside the US. So the concept of you being remote does not exist. You shouldn't even say, if you're in the context of the phone, right? don't lie under certain circumstances about where you are, but in the context of the phone, it's not remote. That's really important. The phone isn't remote. The phone system would be in the US or in Canada. It is local. That an extension on that phone system isn't physically in the US or Canada is irrelevant to everybody, right? The call is originating and terminating in North America, not in the remote location. The extension in that remote location is no different than anyone's uh, roaming system when they're on vacation, right? So that is how you handle it. So there's, no, there's absolutely no piece of the system could detect that you are not in the home location. There's no way to know that you are not US. It would be a US number making US calls with US ringtones terminating in the US, originating in the US. 100% US, except you could be anywhere in the world, anytime, because that's how all business phones work. If your system doesn't do that, it can't be in any legitimate way called a business phone system. It could be a hobby phone system. It could be an antique phone system. It might not even be a phone system, but anything that qualifies to be called with any legitimacy. Lots of, lots of places will try to scam you by slapping the name business onto non-business services. But to qualify in the industry as a business service, it must do this as a minimum. This is just baseline stuff. This is not specialty in any way. Every single business carrier and the majority of non-business carriers offer this automatically. So that is how you handle that in essentially all cases. It solves everything you're imagining and it solves it 100% transparently 
and it solves it 100% in the way it's supposed to be done, right? This is how it's done. This is how every major company does it, and it's just completely transparent. There's zero way, zero, for someone to detect that that's what's happening. So that, I hope, solves that issue for you and makes life easy. All right. Mugwump5949. That was some good info. Unfortunately, I have no idea what he's referring to. What is the story on mail delivery? Sending and receiving local and international mail. Does the mailman come by every day? How do you get stamps and such? All right, so I'm told, supposedly, that the post office does exist. However, I've never seen it. I've never heard of anyone getting mail. I know of no one doing this. This is not a thing. I do have an entire episode on mail. Go check that out for sure. But mail delivery simply isn't a thing here. The concept of it isn't a thing here. Why would anyone want to send paper from one place to another? We don't do that, right? And it really, um, I have a whole video where I rant about this. I absolutely hate this about living in America, that all this garbage is delivered to your house every day. Why? I don't want all that garbage. I didn't authorize that garbage. I didn't ask for that garbage. It is mandated by the federal government that I must receive unsolicited garbage and I have to pay to dispose of it and I have to put in the effort to dispose of it and I have to pay to have someone hold it if I'm not going to be home. It's the worst thing. I truly hate the post system. I hate that it exists. I hate that they're allowed to come to my house. I hate that, that it's there and we're expected to use it. I hate that we have to provide a mailbox. Every aspect of it, I hate. I understand why 100 years ago, it was, a, it was a really grand thing before the internet, and it was super important, and it did a lot to grow the country and build commerce. So I appreciate it historically. But today, it isn't just that it shouldn't be funded or that I don't think people should use it. I think it should be outlawed completely. I don't believe it should be legal. It's a terrible idea in the modern age. So that is my position on whether it should exist. One of the things I love about living outside the United States is that for all intents and purposes, it does not exist. There is no mailman coming to your door. Maybe there's some way to send someone, but I've never seen it or heard of it, or I don't know why it would exist. Maybe there's a post office. Again, I don't know where it is. I don't know anyone who uses it. I don't know why you would. Okay, I did hear that someone I know did know where, what, where it was, supposedly. I have no idea why you would ever use it. How do you send and receive things internationally? So first of all, local delivery. The only things you ever need to move around locally are not paper. Right, if you need to send a letter or something like that, you use the internet, email, things like that. We've had this since the 80s that normal people could do this if they needed to. And since the 90s, everybody could do it casually. And since the 2000s, there's absolutely no excuse for, for not being able to do it. So the need to send something on paper or the expectation that someone will send something on paper does not exist. So the things you need to potentially send are physical items, right? Things that are not letters, but like maybe small packages or whatever. Well, you don't need the post for that. Just like in the US, you don't use the USPS for those things. It's not very cost effective. It's not very reliable. There's no need to use that mechanism. You use FedEx or UPS. Same thing here in Nicaragua. You use someone like Transnica, who very inexpensively moves things directly door to door for delivery. It's very cheap very effective. So highly recommend that. They send people, they have little trucks to go between the cities and then little guys on motorcycles that, the, I mean, the guys are full size, but the, the motorcycles are small. And they go around to the houses and deliver your packages. And if you need something even cheaper delivered, you can send it on something like the Uka bus or on the chicken buses. They'll just strap it to the top, bring it to a city and put and then you go pick it up. They don't deliver to your door, they do that. So that's how you handle those things. You don't need stamps or such or anything of the sort because you don't send things like that. If you're going to send, you go through like Transnica or whatever, and you use their systems. You don't, you don't need to do all that. So the, the reality is, is that it's a problem that's solved by taking the problem away instead of solving the problem. And that sounds weird, but it's like, there's actually not the problem here. We used to have mail delivery. We simply eliminated it for all intents and purposes. And since we eliminated it, we discovered that you don't need to replace it with anything. It was a useless service in the first place in this day and age. Right, definitely had good, uh, uh, good, good purpose for existing in the past. All right, Karen Maneta, thirty-two ninety, says I live in the Esquipulas area of Managua near Price Mart. Okay, I gotta say I love this area. Uh, if you've never looked on a map and never seen this Esquipulas, which I'd love to walk around and film, I plan to, is actually just like south, maybe slightly southwest of uh, the the. Uh, Via Libertad, which is a very rough neighborhood close to the Barrio Venezuela. These are areas that people talk about with great fear, but 
Esquipulas is a kind of um, suburban countryside-ish area. It's very strange, just outside of Libertad. And you go immediately from this bustling city location to kind of wild countryside with fields to like winding tight little streets, but without the cross streets, just little tight roads going twisty through like ravines and, and kind of beginning of the foothills. Right? It's a really interesting area that gets super cute and interesting and it has some interesting access in the city while being very poorly known i think it sits just off the carretera messiah which is the main thoroughfare of uh of managua and it's close to the the price mart and the gallerias out there so uh the galleria and the, the area of the galleria um and so from esquipulas you can very easily go north into the the barrios of southeastern managua where you can go south into the big shopping district and be on the road heading to granada and messiah so it's it's a really interesting area and and there's a lot of cute little shops and hidden things and you and if you're down there driving around it's really interesting because you end up with all these tiny little you know hidden neighborhood bars and stuff the vibe is so different than the rest of managua if you live in that area I, I, Karen can probably tell us, but I, I can't imagine that you feel like a Monoguan when living there, even though you're kind of in the middle of the city. Not exactly. You're definitely not in the middle of the city, but you're really well connected into important parts of the city and can use the city resources so easily. Um, driving through Escapulas is a little bit of a pain. It's, it's slow going. It's easy to get traffic jams. Um, but boy, it's a cool area. Dominica, my wife and I drove through it um, a couple months ago, and it was our first time like traversing all of it. And we kind of uh, we were coming from like the airport and just were trying to get somewhere and ended up there randomly. And we're just amazed by what a cool area it is. Um, but I was hanging out and I'm often in Libertad and um, I was trying to go from Libertad to uh, somewhere near Tequantepe. And that will take you through, if you're not careful, through Esquipulas. And you got to be really careful because there's some spots you can't drive through there, like you know, the dirt roads that are really poorly maintained. The good roads are good, but a lot of bad ones there too. Um, so it's, it's, a cool area to, to discover and you would never realistically be just driving and end up there it's exactly in the spot hidden between things i mean it's a little awkward to get to but what a cool area so i really want to walk it i want to like just go and explore the streets and film a bunch of stuff and it seems like a crazy safe area so i absolutely no concerns whatsoever so i'm excited that someone because it's not a, a heavily populated area at all uh of, of my viewers lives there what a cool spot um so she says um I live in the area near Price Mart. I love Managua. I love you can get anything here and have it delivered for next to nothing. Your love of Leon is probably the best thing to happen to Leon since the Spanish left. So that was really not a question, but Karen, thank you very much for the comment. And uh, and that's so cool that you're in Esquipulas. Uh, I really want to get out there um, and explore. Uh, okay, Patricia, who triggered the video yesterday about the um, uh, the public urination system. Uh, she asked, do those dirt roads hold up well during the rainy season? Can you still, still drive on them? Um, certainly, there are dirt roads in the country that do hold up, but by and large, no, they're absolutely terrible. Um, so it's not actually that you lose them for the rainy season. Typically, you're going to lose them during the rain, uh, mostly in the mornings when the sun's out and you get some time for it to, to dry out. They, they might be muddy. They're generally passable. If they weren't, they would be significant problems because it is the rainy season is six months of the year here. So um, any road that would be completely impassable during the rainy season has to be an extreme side road that you just can go six months without using. So when you're seeing the roads and the ones that she's talking about, I believe we're on the beach on the north side of the Ponoloya Road heading out to the beach pretty far out, um, very remote. But they do have enough rocks in them that a normal car can traverse them even during the heavy rains. I walked on them during some of the heavy rains. I ended up in a situation where I had to go over very large areas um, of, of water and it was very difficult on foot, a car probably could have passed. If it couldn't have passed, it would not have flooded, it would just gotten stuck. A truck would definitely be able to go. If, if you had like a, a Hilux or a Frontier, like a Nissan Frontier, they would have no problem on nearly all the roads. But be aware, during the actual rains, many of those dirt roads, the mud is, is very, very difficult to pass and the, uh, the amount of like flowing water and stuff could be really, really difficult. So in general, the answer is actually going to be no. During the rainy portion of the rainy season, um, then it's going to be, it's going to be mostly impassable. Martin Bowen, 5910, 
Don't want to be in an expat community. I'm an old farmer and like an area away from the population, but close enough to get there in like 45 minutes. Thanks for your insight, Scott. Um, so Martin, sorry for this has been, it was two weeks before I took the screenshot and I took the screenshot in October. So this has been like four months. So these are seriously old uh, uh, questions to ask. Um, so the difficult thing here is that basically the whole country would qualify as this. Nicaragua is essentially a ton of farmland. That's just kind of a way to describe Nicaragua. We, it's interspersed with volcanoes and the occasional city, but by and large, the country is a whole bunch of farmland, which is fantastic. It's beautiful, it's serene, it's tranquil. Um, and for you, you have just a ton of choices. Basically, every single farm lying between Leon and Managua, or between Leon in Chinandega, or within 45 minutes north of Chinandega, or the majority of things between Leon and Madagalpa, or Esteli, will fall within these limits. There will be small areas that are so far out that they are more than an hour from any city. But by and large, something like 80 to 90 percent of the land uh, in western Pacific Nicaragua, the area that you think of as Nicaragua, um, will all qualify as this. Even the areas down in Rivas, if you draw a line 45 minutes in every direction from Rivas, that covers almost the entire departmento of Rivas. If you are willing to consider San Juan del Sur a city, which it is not, but it might have enough resources that you would consider it, that would knock out the part of, of the departmento Rivas that is not within 45 minutes of Rivas proper. Um, if you Once you get into the main parts of uh, the country with the uh, cities of Carrasso, the, the Didiambas, the uh, Hinotepes, the San Marcos, the uh, Managua proper, uh, Granada, Messiah, they cover the entire middle of the country with the 45 minute coverage. You know, by the time you go 45 minutes to one, you're within 45 minutes of the next for sure, often much less. Um, and that gets you all the way to Chinandega. So the only spot you would run out in the west is if you went over 45 minutes north of Chinandega. And again, if you considered El Viejo, that would give you another 10 minutes. Right, at least because they're very close, but that would take you even farther. You make it almost El Salvador. If you're, if you're the the only spot that you actually run into a gap is if you don't consider any of the mid cities in the north of the lake to be close enough uh, in, in size to qualify, and I wouldn't. Right, they they get pretty small. Then there is a slice north of Lago Managua that is far enough from a city on either side that you might be one to two hours east to one of the mountain cities and one to two hours west to Leon or Chinandega, El Viejo, one of those. Um, other than that, you're pretty much everywhere is going to have farmland that qualifies in this way. If you go east of Lago Nicaragua, that's east of, of the big lake, Colcibola, then you, you will have some areas that get more than 45 minutes from either the, the Boaco or Huigalpa cities. Um, mostly in the south, you're getting super remote to a point where most Nicaraguans have never considered going out there and really don't know what there is out there. Um, you're getting into a very remote area and starting to, to press towards the jungle, uh, which is fine. That could be nice areas. That's where you may run into things. But basically, any of the departmentos that you've seen on the show, any place that we're likely to be, any place that normal people are talking about in Nicaragua, short of like the Corn Islands, um, is going to be available farmland within 45 minutes of a city. So the, the most difficult thing here is the sky's the limit for you. You could go anywhere. Out here in Leon and Chinandega, you've got lots of flat, uh, hot farmland. You want to go up to Madagalpa, Esteli, you've got lots of like hillside stuff. So you're going to grow completely different things. It depends what you want to do with that farmland. Um, in nearly all the country, you can grow fruit or vegetables. Um, there's lots of corn or rice or sugar down here in the flat areas where it's hotter. Um, if you head towards uh, uh, Managua, there, there's different crops because it's slightly cooler and not quite as flat. Like you just get a lot of variation as you do in most countries, right? You're just gonna have a lot of things that you can do. Plus you can put up greenhouses just about anywhere. Uh, so really the sky is the limit. It's all about finding an area that's at the climate, the landscape and the price that you want. I would say, honestly, if you have specific crops that you're very interested in, like you're just really passionate about growing, I don't know, bitter oranges, that's gonna be your thing, or rice, right? Then those things will, will dictate you can only be in the areas where those things grow. Rice specifically, you need lots of flat and lots of water. Um, and, and then once you determine where you can do that, and there's all over the country they grow rice. Uh, I think there's, it's in Rivas. I know it's in Chinandega. There's tons in Leon. Leon is a major rice producer. Um, and once you do that, then I would say the thing that almost certainly is going to define where you want to be is the city. 
right? So uh, determine your crops if they matter, or if you just want to farm, you don't care what you grow, then start with the city, right? You fall in love with Leon, this is the city I want to be 45 minutes from, great. Draw a circle 45 minutes around Leon and see what you can find, right? Um, if, if it's Chinandega is your city, do the same thing there. If it's Managua, do it there. Um, and, and that will uh, make it the easiest thing. And then you know that you're getting a city that you like. And there's going to be something affordable within 45 minute zone of any city, right? There's, there's just going to be options. So you don't have to worry about not being able to find anything. All right, Scion13, quite some time ago as well, about two months ago, asked a slew of questions for the fact. So we're going to run through these. I think there's 14. Here we go. Now, some of these I'm not going to be able to answer. Number one, ADHD, medicine, and doctors. I've been asked specifically about this from a lot of people. Here's the reality. I don't have to deal with this particular medication, and so it's not something I know anything about, and it's very difficult for me to research because I wouldn't know where to start, and I'd have to engage doctors and have them do a bunch of work for me for the show, which is a little bit problematic. I, I can't easily go do that. So assume that questions about specific medicine, I will do my best to give you some kind of guidance, but be aware, I, I really can't answer specific uh, medication questions unless it's something I have uh, directly interacted with. What I know, ADHD medicine, does it exist? Absolutely. Is medicine easy to get here and widely available? Absolutely. Um, will you have doctors that, that can treat for that? Absolutely. I would say um, you know, depending on, on what you need. If you know the medication you need, call up a pharmacy and see if you can buy it, right? Start with Pharma Value. They're the big chain in the country. See if you can get the Pharma Value app um, where you are and look up the medications that you want. One of the problems is medications do have different names here sometimes, so be aware that that, that may take a little bit of research. Um, you could get a doctor remotely. That would be no problem at all, right? Um, getting a, a consulting doctor in Nicaragua would be extremely easy. Uh, very affordable, and then you could have a doctor that goes and, and actually buys your medication for you, right? Pay the doctor, they'll go have your medication, make sure it's the right thing, make sure they can get the dosage, know where they can get it, have it all set, um, and then when you arrive, you're, you're good to go and you already have a doctor and everything. Easy, right? Here, you don't need to, to necessarily do an in-person visit. You could very easily have a doctor online, work with them that way. Um, number two, name mismatch on passport. Is marriage license enough? I think you're going to run into problems with this. You want your passport to match. Um, Nicaraguans, as with most of Latin America, do not change their names with a marriage uh, process, right? That is not a thing here. And so the idea that uh, North Americans often do that is often catches people by surprise. Obviously, many people are very aware of it, but many people are not. So you very easily can have uh, someone at border control or someone at Migracion who has no idea that this is a thing, no idea what to do, and very few of the systems in the country are prepared to accommodate it because uh, it's very specific in the U.S. and some other countries that because of the culture of traditionally uh, women changing their name in marriage, that they have mechanisms that will do that almost automatically. And even if they don't, uh, your IT department will know that like your email needs to change and it's a regular thing that they have to tackle from time to time and no one's confused about why you're doing it. Here it would be confusion end to end and really no computer system is set up to address it. So I would be very careful with that. Um, just I would, I would take the effort and have your passport updated. Number three, vaccines required to visit. It's this simple, none. Um, I am not aware of any vaccine that is required for coming into Nicaragua and they don't check. That said, that is for normal people. If you go back in time and travel during the pandemic, there was a portion of the pandemic when you were required to have a COVID-19 vaccine. That has not been the case for quite some time, but for time travelers, it's important to note. Um, very important. Now, in this case, uh, Scion13 said, uh, we still want to get yellow fever. You do not need yellow fever for coming to Nicaragua. I would recommend, it is great to have, I have it. Um, it's hard to get in Nicaragua, certainly available. If you need it, you can get it. It's just, it's a pain. You gotta go to Managua. There's only one place that has it because it's, it's a super uh, specialty thing. It's only for people traveling because we don't have yellow fever in Nicaragua. So if once you're here and you don't have yellow fever, you don't need it. But if you're gonna travel somewhere, and there aren't that many places that, that have it, but we're relatively close to them and it's popular to go to them. So they certainly make it available. Uh, it's very easy to go from Nicaragua to a Colombia, a Bolivia like I did. That's why I have it. Bolivia is a yellow fever country. Um, so when going there, I had to go to Managua and get the yellow fever. But for coming to Nicaragua, they do not ask for any vaccines. They do not require any vaccines. 
Of course, you should have vaccines, right? But just the normal ones. If you're coming from the United States, just follow your regular doctor's um, recommendations and you can ask them if there's anything in Central America that is currently an issue. Um, they should not tell you yellow fever. That is South America and only very small portions of it. Um, but yellow fever as just a general rule is good to have because yellow fever is incredibly dangerous as, uh, as rare as it is, um, you do, it, it's just a good thing to have. But I'm the only one of any of us that has it. Um, there, in theory, are going to be vaccines for things like dengue, chikungunya, um, possibly malaria. No one gets those coming here, but if it's offered to you, that's fine. Um, all of those things do go around here. I've never heard of anyone getting malaria. They're very good about wiping that out. But dengue and chikungunya, they do go around on a regular basis, and they are unpleasant. Um, if you're going to be on vacation, you don't want to spend it with dengue. Just, just general advice, um, but uh, it's not required. They're, they're very rarely super dangerous um, and they're not that bad. So they don't put a strain on the, on the system and you're not gonna be the one spreading it. So they don't worry about it. Number four, I get terrible sunburn in around 15 minutes and don't like anything on my skin. So even in Wisconsin, which is where Paul is from, uh, I stay in the shade as a rule. Is there plenty of shade around? Eh, I don't know. Um, I mean, Nicaragua is a country, right? So it's very difficult to express the amount of shade that a country has. I would say that I generally find when walking around cities that shade is low. Um, I'm in the sun a lot, and you may notice that I wear hats a lot because there's nothing to protect my head if I don't. So that's the one thing I worry about is, is the top of my head um, and my nose. My nose has, has some serious damage from the sun because it's the very often it doesn't quite get blocked. Um, but... Uh, things to be aware of. Uh, Nicaragua has a lot of sun, but it also has a very low altitude with very heavy air. Even though our humidity isn't very high, it was in the 40s the other day, it's typically in the 50s. Um, it, it's very middling. Um, because of our low altitude uh, and being near the, the equator in the ocean, um, we actually have a lot of just air. And that means that the amount of UV radiation hitting the ground from the sun is actually noticeably low, not high, even though it's a really sunny country. You go outside and you're bound to notice the amount of sun that we have um, really quickly, but almost no one burns. But when I went to Bolivia, instantly we're all worried about burning and we could feel it. When I go to Guatemala, instantly I can feel the, the UV radiation hitting my skin. When I come to Nicaragua, I can be outside for hours. I'm from New York, so I'm not used to a lot of sun. And being in the sun here, I never burn. I've been here for three years. I've never once put on sunscreen. And you guys see me, I'm out walking all the time, never once burn. That doesn't mean you shouldn't put on sunscreen. doesn't mean you shouldn't take precautions. I don't burn easily. You clearly do. So, you know, you need to adjust some. But I wouldn't think about Nicaragua as being an expressly terrible location for getting sunburn. I bet Wisconsin is actually worse. The air is so much thinner there. There's so much less UV absorption in the atmosphere that I bet during the summer that Wisconsin does actually cause uh, you to burn more quickly. Uh, number five, insects and snakes, how many? How often? And are they all lethal? So actually, this is surprisingly good here. Are there poisonous snakes? Yes, absolutely. Are they common? No. Have I seen one? No. Snakes? Yes. Venomous, no. Um, uh, okay, so for insects, things that are dangerous, basically nothing. Um, there are scorpions. They are not like the United States, so they're, they're much less uh, venomous than in the United States um, and probably less aggressive because you're just much, much more likely to step on them. Um, they are not uncommon, so that you might see a scorpion uh, is, is definitely possible, um, but uh, they are not very dangerous in general unless you're allergic, um, but that's about it. Like really our insects here are incredibly good, except for mosquitoes. They just suck. Um, and, but, but we don't have nearly as many mosquitoes as say Texas or Alabama or New York or Ontario, Canada. So, uh, you know, your, your mileage is, is depending on where you're from. We certainly do not have as many mosquitoes as most of Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, snakes. We have Honestly, not that many snakes. Um, we have seen some. Um, we have things of varying 
uh, danger, but of dangerous snakes. I've never encountered one here. Um, they're, they're not that frequent. Um, not something you normally have to worry about at all. If you're going to be doing jungle hikes, of course, uh, you start to worry about all kinds of things in the jungle. Um, but if you're living in the suburbs, if you're living in the, in the countryside between the cities, I would say that while you may see snakes, it's not something to be concerned about at all. And the insects, psh, nothing. The, you just take normal precautions against scorpions. Don't be stupid. Don't leave, don't, you know, knock out your shoes before you put them on. Uh, don't let your, your bed uh, cloths drape on the floor, things like that. Um, but you get used to just doing that really quickly and, and I have no reason to worry whatsoever. Museums in Leon, cathedrals, old Leon. So yes, Leon is a, is a museum city. We have the number one art museum in all Central America, not just in the country. Fantastic. Uh, we have a number of other museums, the Myths and Legends. Some of them get pretty goofy. They're still worth going. Uh, the Myths and Legends, the, um, the, the Museum of the Revolution, um, the Ruben Dario Museum, uh, the Sutiava Museum. Um, you know, we probably have 10 museums here in Leon, uh, and, and certainly the, the Ortiz Gurdian Museum. Um, has to be checked out. That is the art museum. Cathedral. Yes, we have one of the most important cathedrals in northern Latin America. Uh, lots of great stories around it. Not it's not just does Nicaragua have a good cathedral. Leon specifically has an epic cathedral. Um, we have the cathedral for Nicaragua. It's not the one on the postcards. We have the one that is so famous for what it is. It's just, it's so big in the middle of town. Um, and it's not technically a cathedral. Everyone calls it that. It's actually a basilica. We're a level above cathedral. We just don't want to be pretentious, so we call it a cathedral. Uh, Old Leon, its real name is Leon Viejo. And yes, absolutely, I would go there. Um, it is actually a museum. So that city is a lot like a Pompeii, uh, and it is a buried city that the volcano um, erupted and covered, and it is now a museum and an archeological site. It's very interesting. You could spend half a day there probably, uh, and it's right by um, the port of Mombatumbo. Uh, which is a nice spot to stop and see the lake, maybe get food. Not a lot to do there, but there's, there's a couple of restaurants and stuff, and it's a beautiful view next to the volcano that buried the old city. It's not very far from, from Leon proper, so definitely a good place to go uh, check out. If you're, if you're into museums and you're into lakes and you're into ar uh, archaeology, it's a good combination of all of that. And when you pay to go in there, it's not free. You actually get a tour guide. Um, so they speak Spanish, so just be aware. You might want a translator and you'll get more out of it. Definitely bring cameras and stuff. There's a lot of walking around up there because it is a buried city. Uh, day trips, number seven, day trips from Leon to beaches. Absolutely, Leon is the only city that has beaches actually be part of the metro area. It has two beaches that are actually part of the city. That's Ponaloya in the north and Las Pinitas in the south. I may be partial, but I prefer Las Manitas. That is what drew me to the area specifically. Um, Leon is a great city, but but the beaches, when we first went to Ponaloya, we were like, eh, what's this? And then when we went to Las Manitas, we moved. So if that gives you anything to go on, but they are both bustling be beaches with a lot going on. They've got restaurants and surfing and uh, tours of the, the nature areas. And uh, I said surfing and sunbathing and drinking and, and night parties and all kinds of stuff, right? So they're, they're lively and you can spend a bit of time on on those for sure. If you want to go to farther flung beaches, Leon does have them. Those beaches are so close, you can just take a taxi from town. It'll be about 400 or 450 cord for a car to go out. So that's somewhere in the, you know, 11 to $13 range, which is not super cheap, but it's not terrible. There is a bus if you want to uh, venture with the bus uh, per person, it's like less than 25 cents. Uh, but if you want to go farther, uh, the next beach south of those, but still in the Leon area, is. Uh, Salinas Grandes, that is a very remote beach on a very rough road. Uh, not a lot to do down there, but it is absolutely beautiful. So if you're looking for just some time to spend on a serene beach without too many people around, it is perfect for that. Uh, going south of there, there are more beaches that are technically part of Leon the Departamento, but we don't think of them as part of Leon the city. They are part of La Paz Centro or Nagarote, the southern or eastern cities of, Le of Departamento Leon. Um, that includes El Transito, uh, Puerto Sandino, uh, Miramar and uh, Valero and others like that. There's some stuff to do down there. They're nice beaches, but you're getting really far out. And by the time you've done two or three of the beaches closer to Leon, those may not hold that much interest. If you're a really big beach goer, for sure, check those out. Then they are like Valero's completely different in every way than any of the others I mentioned. And El Transito is different than all the others. And Puerto Sandino is different, right? So there, there is some variety for sure, just in the Leon beaches, um, but that may not be worth the trip unless you're gonna be here for a while and are really into beaches. 
Number eight, how religious is it and how friendly towards non-religious? Um, so we had an episode recently about how religious is Nicaragua. And generally the answer is um, it's not a super religious country. It's not a super religious city. Uh, roughly something like 75 to 80% of the population identifies as being associated with a religion, whatever that means. Um, in practice on the ground, I think you find that people are all about 50-50 actually religious versus not. Um, they are completely, this is a secular country. They are completely friendly to non-religious people. It is absolutely an expectation. Um, this is this is nothing like being in North America where there's a very strong political push to be religious uh, as part of society and part of you know patriotism or anything like that. In absolutely no way uh, does the church control the country. And even within any within the religious groups, there is no religion that represents greater than 50% of the population. So even though you have a fairly religious population, however, whether it's 50% or 80%, who knows, uh, within that group, no one, no single group identifies as being greater than 50%. The, by far the largest is the Catholics, and they represent about 43%. So they're, they're, they definitely have primacy, but they do not have a majority. Without a majority in any specific religious group, the entire concept tends to be much more open and relaxed because there's, there's no, oh, you have to be part of a certain group you're just free to do whatever. Uh, so it's a, it's a very open, very relaxed uh, religious atmosphere or non-religious atmosphere, as the case may be. Number nine, what things can we bring to donate to locals? What's easy for us to bring, but hard for you to get? Honestly, I wouldn't do this. Um, a lot of people ask about how to do things like this, and it you might be able to find something that people are interested in, but it's, um, uh, and, and not that people wouldn't appreciate it. It is a strange gesture. It would, it would be awkward. Um, the things that we're always worried about getting are things like laptops. And, and at best, you can bring one laptop and are you going to donate a laptop to a random person you meet on the street? Probably not. Um, uh, you know, I can tell you, like, I have a friend who just really loves getting beef jerky brought from the United States. But that's very specifically something that he misses when he used to live there and can't get anymore. Um, so I, I would just not do that. Um, just plan on spending more time, um, shop more from local vendors, do things to support the economy for sure. It's super appreciated, um, but, but bringing things probably doesn't make sense unless you know someone who specifically needs something and you're helping them out. Um, then for sure, for sure, we need, we need that stuff. Uh, number 10, water safe to drink, ice, vegetables. Yeah, the water safe. Um, there's going to be exceptions, especially on the beaches. You may run into water supply problems, but it's not because of Nicaragua. It's because of the shallow water because of the ocean. It's just normal things by any water uh, source anywhere. Um, now, most Nicaraguans who can don't drink the tap water. They drink bottled water that's bottled here in country. Um, very, very cheap. Uh, and and not a problem at all. If you do get exposed to tap water, it's not a problem. We don't have bacteria in the, in the tap water. Um, I, I don't know of any jurisdiction in the country. I'm not saying there are, I, I'm sure there are, but I don't know of any where it's not safe to drink the water and I don't know anywhere where people don't. Um, in much of the country, keep in mind, it is a relatively poor country. So people do drink the tap water quite extensively. If it was dangerous, that would be a major problem um, because the, the poor communities uh, would, would be very adversely affected by that. And our government here is extremely sensitive to things that affect the, the impoverished communities. So they're, they're very careful uh, to make sure things like water supply uh, is generally safe. That doesn't mean it's great. It may taste bad. Um, it may not be that cold, may not be that warm, like it'll just be something you're not expecting. Um, don't be surprised if it, if it, if it is going to have something, it's going to have metal in it, much more likely than bacteria. So small exposure, generally not a problem. It's if you're going to drink it for a lifetime, that's where you want to worry about, oh, it may cause uh, liver or kidney problems, but certainly while you're on vacation, you don't have to worry about it. Again, just I would drink bottled water. I, I wouldn't. I, I don't care. But for most people, I'd recommend bottled water um, just to have that extra level of, of, you know, you don't have to worry about anything. Um, just in case you do happen to have a spot where there, there has been bad water, you don't have to worry about it. Um, but it's extremely, extremely minor. And if you're talking about like brushing teeth, taking a shower, don't worry. Brush your teeth with the tap. I wouldn't think twice about it. I've never once brushed with bottled water, right? Just, just, I don't do it. Um, all, and everyone I know, right? Every expat that I know uses the tap for things. They clean their food with it, cook with it, brush their teeth with it. We just don't drink it. When I'm putting down a liter of water into my system all at once, I don't use the tap. When I'm making coffee, I don't use the tap. When I'm making soup, I use the tap, right? That's, it depends how much liquid you're getting. If I'm, uh, you know, if I'm making ramen, yeah, I don't use the tap, but that's because my water bottle thing has a built-in water heater. Um, 
but yeah, vegetables, ice, don't worry about it, right? Don't be those Americans who are like, is this ice filtered? It is not filtered. No one has filters because there's nothing to filter. It's all fine. Um, but everyone uses the ice. Everyone eats the vegetables completely fine. Number 11, cannabis laws. We're hearing very likely these are going to be repealed and that cannabis will likely be legal soon. Currently, it is not. Be careful. They generally look the other way when you're tourists, as long as you're not selling, right? If you're just smoking some, don't do it obviously. Don't get in someone's face. Don't brag about it. Do it quietly. And even if the police are aware, they generally are going to look the other way. They don't want to cause problems with tourists. Um, and, they, and they know that you smoking it doesn't affect anybody, right? It's, that's you. Um, what they don't want is locals buying it currently, but that's becoming lax as well. They certainly don't want you selling it. Don't even think about that. You will go to jail. You will be unhappy. Um, but in general, um, it's not too big of a deal, but I can't tell you it's legal. It certainly is not. I can't tell you I don't know people who are in jail long term for it. They were selling it. They were idiots and sold it more than one time. They're in jail for a long time, right? That, that will happen. Don't be, don't be that guy. Right, but if you just need to smoke some, just be discreet, use sensible um, tactics. Um, don't go into a restaurant, do it in the middle of the restaurant. But even that, we see happen all the time, no problems. I still wouldn't advise it, right? Uh, foreigners driving cars, US license, international license. This is number 12. Uh, yeah, so you're within North America, so the North American treaties are in effect. That means US licenses, Canadian licenses, you can just drive. Do you need an inter international driver's license, an IDL, the thing you get from, from AAA? No, there's absolutely no need for that. I always recommend it. It's nice to have, but it's also a pain in the butt to get. So I understand why you don't have it, but it is not required here. I've never in all the years I've been here, been asked for it, heard of anyone been asked for it, are aware that the Nicaraguans even know what it is. I don't think they, they do. They are very familiar with American licenses. They are used absolutely everywhere. Um, they won't even they won't be surprised in any way. They'll just get your U.S. license and go, yep, and, and be on your way. So easy. So just, yeah, U.S. license, you're good to go. Number 13, speaking Spanish. I will try to learn as much as I can, but I'm terrible at it. Are there English speakers around? So this really depends where you go. Um, there are an awful lot of English speakers in the country. It is the second language of the country, both officially, as in there's a whole, there's two whole regions that that's their primary language, uh, but also there is uh, in schools and stuff, English is the, is the first foreign language that is generally taught. So are there English speakers around? Yes. Are there, there ones that speak pretty well? Yes. Could you easily end up at hotels in major areas and have no one who speaks English? Yes, it, it can happen. Um, there, it, it's not a huge portion of the population. Um, they're sprinkled all around, the people who can do it. So um, it is good to speak as much Spanish as you can. People will be really helpful. I, I wouldn't worry about coming down and not speaking English, but be aware that you're going to find very few English speakers um, You know, in, in very touristy um, occupations, they're much more likely, but uh, once you can speak English, you can command a pretty high salary, not in the tourist industry. So the majority of people who speak English pretty well have been sucked up to call center jobs in Managua. Um, it's basically guaranteed work uh, once you speak fluent English in, in any, you know, you could have no other skill uh, and make four times the minimum wage just because you speak English. So. So just be aware that it's, yeah, it's best. The more Spanish you speak, the easier it'll be. Number 14, immigrant requirement, immigrant retirement is age 45. How does that work? No, anyone doing it? I know lots of people doing it. Yeah, so um, pretty much, uh, if, so first of all, do you actually have to be 45? Maybe. Um, don't, don't even think of that as a hard limit. Think of it as a suggestion. Um, generally, what we say is all the rules, especially for these kinds of things, are guidelines. They're not hard and fast rules. It's more like, here's what we expect. Make sure that the people who are coming at least meet these these minimums. And minimum has a very weird uh, usage here, right? In the United States, we would say the minimum age is 45, meaning you must be 45 or older, period. And that'd be the end of it. But here, when they say minimum, they would say, well, what's minimum? Is 44 better than 45 or worse? How do I know which is the minimum? They look at the whole and, and say, is this person as a, as a package, as a human, better or worse than the guideline? And so if they say something like you have to be 45 and have a thousand dollars a month of income and then you can retire, well, they understand that more money is better. Um, maybe if you're 40, but have $2,000 a month of retirement income, they go good enough, right? Is that meeting the minimum? Maybe it is. It's kind of open to interpretation, but there's a strict guideline. This is what the minimum should look like, but you can use a flexible guide of 
you know, what how you know, what if you're 80 but only have 900 a month? Eh, maybe that's okay. Maybe that combination met the requirement, right? So it'll depend who's your immigration uh, officer. But, and it'll also depend, you know, how well your immigration lawyer can argue for you. Look, I understand they're only 42, but they make $10,000 a month. Do you really want to turn someone down because they make 10 times the minimum on money, but they're not quite old enough? Seriously, they're way above the minimum. It'd be very likely that the immigration officer would say, wow, they are, they're way better than the minimum. Great, we'll take them, right? They have that flexibility. It's not each little rule isn't a hard and fast. It's a general guideline, they work with it. So basically it comes down to this for, for retirement immigration. You're supposed to be at least 45, whatever that means. You're supposed to make, I believe the number is 1,000, it might be 1,200 um, of, of retirement income. And again, they have some, some real strict guidelines. It's supposed to be a pension. No American has pensions, like that's not a thing in America. So maybe you have to have a little bit more. Maybe you have 1,400, but it's uh, not pension. Maybe it's, uh, it's a foreign job, or it's a, a retirement account, a 401k, something like that. Talk to your lawyer and say, look, here, I'm putting together my package. This is my age. This is my, my retirement money. This is how I get it. Let's make this look good, right? And then your lawyer can sit with you and say, how do we make you um, meet or exceed the minimums? And, and it's like the number of people that we have fail because they can't do that is basically none. My light just died. I went through an entire battery. Um, so that is a perfect cue that I just got to the last question on Scion 13's list and uh, hopefully answered that. Um, but that's the general thing, right? It's that easy. But you don't have to worry about that until you come here, right? Come to Nicaragua. Uh, uh, stay as a tourist for at least a year. You get 180 days. So do 180, go out to Costa Rica normally, spend a day, spend a week, have a nice vacation, come back to another 180 days. After that year, make some determinations. You'll have a great idea what you think of the country. You'll have a great idea of what you want to do. You'll be at least a year older before you apply. And from the time you apply, that process could take two months. It could take a year, right? So you might be two years older. But so even if you're just turning 43 now, start this process right now. You'll be 44 before you apply and then just apply, stall a little bit. When they say you're not 45, you say, no, but I will be by the time you file the paperwork and they'll be like, ha, ah, cool, you got us, right? Like that's seriously how it works. So be a little bit flexible in your interpretation of what's required. And as long as you are coming here, and this is part of what they consider, you come here and act as a tourist for a year, two years, right? During that time, they're going to evaluate. Have you been good? Have you been breaking the law? Have you been doing things they don't like? Have you been contributing positively to your community? Have you done good things? Or, you know, if they look at you and say, but boy, they, they're really skating by in the minimums. They're not quite 45. They don't make enough money. But my gosh, oh, they're doing all this great stuff for the community. They've, you know, started making a YouTube channel and telling the world about us or whatever. Then they can take those things and say, ah, the overall package of this human is better than our minimum. We would like them to be a, a long-term uh, retiree resident of our country, and that's all it takes, right? So um, it's, it's a flexible process, and the best result will come from getting started, getting a good lawyer, and letting them, over time, assemble the package of you to present to the government um, in, in the way that makes the most sense for everyone. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. I hope you enjoyed this completely different episode. I hope this looks and sounds good. Um, I've not checked any of the footage from this yet, but I'm loving that the camera just runs for all this. Like, we're in a cool room with air conditioning. I've got the active fan on, but this is the Fuji, and it's just going. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, this turns out really well. With the microphone is up there, so I'm able to just sit back and relax and read the screens. Might do this a little bit. I want your feedback. I do have to get curtains for behind because this is kind of ugly, but we're going to improve that. Thanks for joining me. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, post on social media. Tell your friends and family about the show. Uh, I'm going to really quickly show you, uh, if you haven't seen it, this is the other camera. When you guys are saying that the Sony looks really awesome, this is the, this is the camera. I love how cute and little this is. Like what? A cool thing. I'm going to be walking around with this quite a lot when I'm doing these shorts. Uh, I'm doing it like this, like I'm holding up the camera and talking. This is not the this is not the big rig, but this is my walking around getting you footage of the country every day camera. Pretty soon you're going to start seeing a lot more from that. I hope it fits in my pocket. I can just grab stuff all the time. So I wanted to show that because I'm excited about it. I worked so hard to get a white one. But thanks to all of you, Javier especially, who worked so hard to uh, raise the funds and make that camera possible for me and for you and everyone. I really appreciate it. What a great community we have here. And thank you so much for the questions. And remember, get down with your questions. This is fun and it makes my life a lot easier knowing that I have these that I can queue up for days when uh, I just have to get through the show a lot faster. I really do appreciate it. And I will see all of you 
tomorrow.